fact, he is one of our foremost public intellectuals, writers, thinkers, has also been an administrator and diplomat. And he's out with his new book that actually calls for India to abolish capital punishment. Joining us on the buck stops here is Gopal Krishna Gandhi to talk about the death penalty and much more. Welcome to the show, sir. You take an unpopular position at a time when most people would dismiss this as a liberal fantasy. And the reason that they would say that is because they would argue that India actually has a rather reasonable position on capital punishment, that the rarest of rare principle that was upheld by the Supreme Court uh, makes us a country that isn't typically trigger happy, that we have seen uh, perhaps only four executions in the last 12 years or more. Um, what is wrong with rarest of rare? It's not wrong. It's uh, what disturbs you? inadequate. What is um, very good in itself, the rarest of rare, was an improvement on the earlier position yeah. when um, the whole field was open. And then in Bachchan Singh, a huge and transformative leap forward was given in which the Supreme Court said, no, this is not right. It has to be very rare. It has to be so rare as to say, my God, was it so horrible? Mm. Now, that was an improvement. But the rarest of rare left the whole field to interpretation. Who is to decide what is rare? Who is to decide what is the rarest of rare? Is it the government? Is it then the cabinet? In, in the cabinet, is it the home minister or the prime minister? Finally, is it the president? Mm. So that is... Well, it's all of them, right? In the process is, that it we is follow, all of it them. is all of them. It is all of them um, the up courts. to a point. Up to a point, it is all of them. But it also depends on who constitutes the all. If it is a prime minister who is too preoccupied to go into murder cases or to cases of death punishment for any other crime, then he will leave it to the cabinet and leave it perhaps even to the officials. Mm. But then when it goes to the president, it is just one person. It's not all. And we have had presidents who have really gone into the matter very deeply yeah. and have not said no to the government's recommendation but have said could this not have been decided differently yeah. did you go into this aspect or that yeah. and i'm specifically thinking of president K. R. Naranen, who went into each um, recommendation for death penalty very carefully and and, he, I, and and the contrast of course is president pranam mukherjee right now who has actually turned down more mercy petitions than any president in recent memory and we had two presidents in between them, uh, both President Abdul Kalam and President Pratibha Patil, who by temperament uh, were not in favor of the death penalty. And they did not um, accept a single recommendation for death penalty, except in one case when uh, President Abdul Kalam did accept it. But otherwise he didn't. Pre Pre president Patil also did not. So it, it finally boils down to the president. And I think when it comes to one person's temperament or one person's attitude, one person's ph penological philosophy, I think it's a too huge a responsibility. Too so what I'm hearing you argue is that it, it, is, it is left eventually, mercy or no mercy, yeah. to the individual subjective ideology or, or, or predilection right. of one person and that is too dangerous uh, in terms of matters of life and death. Yes, I think that is, uh, the, the, the pinnacle of responsibility is too brittle. And if we see the 13 presidents that we've had, it varies from case to case. And in fact, it started with the first uh, head of state who was not, or rather the second head of state, who was not president, but who was governor general. And he had to handle the very first death sentence case. Mm. And it happened to be the death sentence case of Nathuram Godse. The first Indian to be hanged in free India was the man who had assassinated the father of the nation, as some people call him, but also the person who had gone on record as opposing the death penalty. But, but also the person who assassinated, for you personally, your grandfather. That's so happens and, to be the and, case. No, and the reason yeah. that that is relevant even to your intellectual position is because one of the things that you hear all the time, and you write about this in your book, is what do you say to the victim of a horrific murder, yeah. a gang rape, a terror attack. And you do concede that yeah. there is yet to be an emotionally credible argument that yeah. you can make to somebody in that moment of anguish. So when you look at yourself as having, uh, in your personal capacity, you know, 
your grandfather's killer is executed. It is the first execution, as you said, in independent India. Do you, does that make you see it a bit differently, that your family may have seen it a bit differently? He wasn't just the father of the nation. He was an actual father, an actual grandfather. I must say that uh, I had no um, emotional connect with that episode because I was too small. But I also know that from the very time that I've known of uh, his assassination, mm -hmm. I've known of the fact that um, two of my uncles petitioned the Governor General to pardon Nathuram Godse. And I think uh, these went together. It is quite extraordinary that uh, at the very time when he was in, in jail and when the trial was on, uh, these two sons of uh, Mahatma Gandhi said that Godse and Apte should not hang. Mm. That was a remarkable thing for uh, the next of kin to take that position. Now, moving from that, I think I must come to, to, come to this um, a much larger issue that the Constituent Assembly, which was in session at the time, mm. which would have, I think, otherwise uh, gone ahead and banned death penalty, stayed its hand. Earlier on, Dr. Ambedkar has said that death penalty should go. The Congress party itself in 1931 in Karachi Congress had taken an official position saying death penalty should go. Mm. But when it was drafting the constitution, it did not do so. And I think Gandhi's assassination was, was very central to that. And I think it is a very sad thing that it did not do it because it would have been a moral triumph of, of great dimensions if free India had said at the threshold of its independence that the father of the nation has been assassinated. But we believe that um, the political evolution of penology, the moral evolution of punishments requires us to heed what he himself said hmm. and ban the death sentence. It because would he would not have wanted his killer to be executed. He would certainly not have wanted his killer to be as executed. He would not, he did not believe in death, uh, death penalty as a valid form of penalty, of punishment. And I think that would have placed India on the same footing as South Africa. When Mandela, one of the first things he did was to abolish the death sentence. But let me push you a little bit on yeah. this, because you write that the the continuance of the death penalty is unimaginably, is not just unimaginably evil, but sovereignly stupid. And that, in fact, it's a folly that swings between tragedy and idiocy. Yeah. Tragedy and idiocy. Was it tragic that Ajmal Kassab was executed? And I ask you about him particularly, because it is one of the examples that we often hold as a country uh, with pride of the fact that due process was followed. In fact, when we talk about fake encounters and stage mm -hmm. killings, we point to Kassab and we say this is a country that gave Kassab due process and he was executed only after several years of due process. Was a Kassab execution tragic or idiotic or a folly? Individual executions are neither tragic nor uh, idiotic, uh, but the whole process which individual executions in a way climax. That process is supremely stupid. And why is it stupid, apart from being extremely sad? It is because it is just not serving its purpose. It is being so completely self-defeating. I don't want to talk about Kassab or an individual, but take terrorism itself. Yes. If terrorism is deterred by the death sentence, we should have had no terrorism by now. We have had four important executions in that context. Abzal Guru, but Yaku, we, have, yeah. we have not seen any effect on, on, on terror. Uh, on the contrary, I think we should also realize that there is something very um, self-justifying, self-vindicative about uh, the death sentence being handed to terrorists because m many of them, uh, emerging as they are from that particular school of thought and school of training, want martyrdom as the consummation of everything that they're doing. In fact, what they're seeking is martyrdom. What they're seeking is shahadat. And it is actually being given to them on a state platter. So I don't think uh, state... Um, you say capital punishment is giving the terrorist what he wants. It is, um, in fact, um, um, saturating a certain trained instinct, a willed action, which leads to shahadat, is being mm. given to him. I think th this is what makes it so self-defeating. Similarly, in, in, in cases which um, have been now regarded as um, uh, deserving of punishment, Nirbhaya has, has uh, 
lust, blind lust, come down as a result of any death punishment. I doubt it. Um, it's very good that um, there is uh, due process being followed and due process being followed uh, to, uh, to the extent that these people are in jail and the whole country sort of waiting to see its climate almost like a public uh, witnessing of an execution. You, you actually compare it to, uh, to a cricket match and you say it's almost spectator sport like like a cricket match. This is also because of um, television, real time coverage. And I don't see uh, how media can shut itself from covering it. It can't because yeah. it, is, it has to report it. Yeah. On the other hand, there is, um, there is a kind of um, um, public prurience that is being uh, catered to. Uh, that is one side of it. The more important side is the deterrence side, which is what we were talking about. I don't think either has been deterred. Deterrence as a justification of death penalty has been found to be hollow for a long time. But what is, there has to be some purpose being served by death penalty. But, but you know the country that would call itself, and, and though that would be under question now after Donald Trump, but American exceptionalism as it's often referred yeah. to, America would argue that it is among the freest countries in the world. There are some institutional freedoms there that are indeed sacred, like free yeah. speech, right? It has not banned capital punishment. The United Nations recently debates this. India argues that countries must have the right, the sovereign right, to set their own laws and therefore votes against a resolution to ban it mm -hmm. and votes for the amendment that allows for countries to do this. How do you see this collision uh, between a larger international consensus that the UN attempted and countries perhaps reasonably arguing that we are sovereign countries who will set laws for ourselves? Uh, we have to see uh, the world in its totality. Today out of the 195 countries in the world, 140 have abolished it. It's an international trend. It's a global trend. But at the same time, you should also not forget that China and India continuing with uh, the, the death sentence means that the majority of the population of the world is still under the death sentence. Majority of the countries have abolished it. But in terms of demography, the majority of the people inhabiting this planet are still governed by the death yeah. sentence. In the case of the United States, uh, it's not an uh, undifferentiated mass. Different states within the United States have different laws. So United States as a, as a country can't be said to be either abolitionist or retentionist. It is a patchy picture from the United States. As a totality, yes, it is still uh, a, a hanging, or not a hanging, but a death sentence mm. country. Where does that leave us in terms of what you asked? I think the states which have kept death penalty on their statute books are states which want the sovereign power of the state over human life to remain. It is something which has come down from Socrates' times. Mm. Socrates Christ down to our times. The state is a small god, a demigod. Mm. It wants the power to take life, even if it does not exercise it. Mm. As for instance, in our case, rarest of rare, only four cases. But still, if that is the case, why should the state have that power? It is just because the state wants to think of itself as demigod. It so wants to have the power to extinguish life. And this is, since we started, mm. uh, coincidentally with Gandhi, I want to say that one of the reasons why he, why he said he was against the death penalty is, it's very curious, the man was always ahead of his times. He said, only he who has the right to give life has the right to take life. He was talking theologically about God. That was one of the reasons. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> that is what the, the state does. It can't give Play life, God. but it can take life. But, you know, on this, uh, on this thought about the state playing God, yeah. I, I, I want to bring in uh, something you, you actually mentioned in your uh, recent memorial lecture, the Justice Tarkunde memorial lecture, where you spoke about, you know, India versus India, yeah. right? The many paradoxes of India, how the how we as Indians, we're accepting, we are, you know, fatalistic, yet we're anti-fatalistic. You spoke about, in a sense, the collision between the notion of kismet and looking for insaf, and justice. And before I get to other parts of the lecture, it could be argued that Indians who support the death penalty are looking for insaf, for justice. They're looking for retribution, which is different from justice. And those who want retribution have every right to want retribution. 
Nirbhaya's family has every right to ask for the ultimate and the highest punishment available for that particular crime. Yeah. And no abolitionist can look a um, victim's skin in the eye and say, we should abolish death penalty. We have to just go speechless because they have the right, they have the reason to say, I want retribution. But that is their privilege and that is the alpha and omega of their story. So what should the law be instead? The law has to not reflect. The law has to lead. The constitution is not meant to just portray. It is meant to take forward. This, the, the evolutionary process of a country from wherever it is to something little beyond or much beyond is the aim of great constitutions such as ours. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and I think if only representation was uh, the aim of parliament and of constitution, we would not have banned untouchability. Yeah. We would not have uh, banned dowry. They, if I, I, I do believe that the majority opinion in, in our country would be for retaining the death sentence. It would be yes. today. Yes. Um, it was not some years ago. In 1931, when Bhagat Singh was hanged, mm. the country was completely against the death sentence and it wanted it to go. Yeah. But today it is in favor of death sentence. But I'm sure when untouchability was banned, had, had a referendum been taken, it may not have supported the banning of untouchability. Support it may not have supported the banning of dowry. So the state, as ref reflected in its um, evolu po policy evolutions in parliament, has to be ahead of its times. And cannot be majoritarian or necessarily populist. Cannot be a figurative painter of reality. It has to think of an abstract future. Can I, can I ask you to step back and look at a larger picture of, yeah. of what's happening around the world? And yeah, this is important, important to the argument you're making. Uh, the Economist today writes about how liberals need to find a different idiom, a different grammar. Mm -hmm. They need to stop talking in echo chambers. Uh, the Trump victory, the Brexit vote, right? You can look at examples all around the world. Uh, even in India, there is a huge pushback against what would be sometimes yeah. called left-leaning liberals or mm. progressives. Where do you identify the failure of, of liberal politics? Why are we seeing, in fact, what could be called a global lurch to the right of center? I think the question is very valid. The answer is uh, very difficult. Liberals have uh, failed. That is true. One has to say that. Even but, in India? Um, particularly in India. But that doesn't mean that their cause uh, was therefore incorrect. They have failed, I believe, very um, badly for strategic reasons. They have um, you use a very good phrase, eco chambers, I was hearing mm. for the first time, they speak to themselves. Yeah. And they very rarely uh, engage in uh, discussion with people who have a different view. Uh, with the result that they have uh, become elitist. Mm. It's just as simple as that. Now, today there was a, a, a terrible event in one of the schools in the United States where Ohio children were... Yes. Trump will say, haven't I been saying this all the time? In a, in, a, in a sense, Trump would be shown to be right. And those who have been saying that we should not react and overreact to mm. these things would be shown to, to, to look almost innocent and naive. The same thing happens in India. But we underestimate the intelligence of the people of India to respond to the rightness and wrongness of things without calling those rightness and wrongness liberal or illiberal. The people of India have a very strong sense of fairness. Mm. And I think the self-definition of liberals as a permissive set has been devastating to them. Mm. What they should really look for is a description of themselves and a self-description of themselves as people who stand for what is right and what is fair. And that can change from situation to situation and context to context. So it doesn't have to be dogma. There is the dogma of the, ident of the liberal as well, right? The liberals should not be clubist. Mm. The liberals have to be with the situation and the context wherever it occurs. And we are on the subject of the death penalty. 
I can understand a liberal uh, saying what has been said in this book across the world. Yes. But a liberal should be able to say this at a time when terror has made the death punishment, the capital punishment, the death penalty um, a popular cry. Hmm. That is when this kind of book should be published and it just so happens it has come now. Yeah. I, I, but going beyond the death penalty, I, I think the liberal position has to cover the entire gamut of the criminal investigation system. That is the whole purpose of this book. It is not just about the rope or the injection or the bullet. It is about everything that starts from the FIR in the Thana, where the state's possession of the body of mm. the accused and the convict yeah. begins to act. And then it is available to the state for being pummeled physically and psychologically. Yeah. And that is exactly what is happening. From stage one in the Thana to becoming an under trial, then to becoming a convict, yeah. then finally perhaps if it is a three not two or a light yeah. death sentence to the gallows. Yeah. That is an integral whole. And the purpose of this book is not to say that the death sentence should go. The purpose of this book is that the entire process of handling crime in India has to be in step with the best practices in the world. We have improved a great deal and yeah. we must this is where liberals keep, keep also go it. wrong. Liberals will say, oh, we are such a rotten state. Yeah. We, we, we have done huge things by way of reform in jails. The prison today is not what it was oh, 50, yes. 50 years ago. Yes. It's not just called a correctional home, but it really is in many ways. But nonetheless, yeah. the large number of prisoners, in the largest number of prisoners in India are under trials. Yeah. And a large number of those are probably completely innocent. And there is also the class dimension and, 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 and there is and the, the class dimension and, and, and there's also the social it's now increasingly becoming a social issue. I do have to ask you in the end to talk about something contemporary, not the death penalty, yeah. but another D, the All demonetization. Right. You Go make ahead. a fleeting reference to it in your in your uh, Tarkunde Memorial talk where you say we have uh, at our present preoccupation with the famine of currency makes me wonder whether we are to admire the great patience being shown by our people or lament the lack of protest among them. Uh, the fact is that the first electoral tests in from Maharashtra and Gujarat do not actually show an angry population if they are to be treated as the first local electoral tests. In fact, the BJP has done quite well. Uh, do you see this as a lament or do you see this as the patience of the people? Because you say that these are almost simultaneously the mindsets. And how do you see yeah. demonetization vis-a-vis -vis the larger debate about the role of the state? Because that's in fact exactly what we were debating vis-a-vis -vis the death penalty. I think that's a very smart uh, hijacking of the subject. <laughs> <but> Just one <laughs> question. But, so I, not really no, but, I, but I really welcome it. Um, I, I would say this, the patience of our people, the forbearance of our people, the fortitude of our people uh, is legendary. And whenever we have had natural calamities of a mag mega scale, yeah. we may have had war, the people of India show themselves to be the finest human specimens anywhere. And I, I really and sincerely believe that um, this spell of um, cash strappedness is being seen by people as a kind of visitation. And uh, there is a fatalistic acceptance of this as one might accept um, sudden famine. Now, Chennai uh, last year mm. was in floods. This year we are on the verge of a famine, a waterless yeah. month yeah. or two months yeah. ahead. People are used to calamities and shortages um, suddenly uh, descending on them and they just adapt, adapt brilliantly. And I think they have done precisely the same with this. They have seen this as something which is beyond their control. And it's, um, the, there's a, this Hindi word vyapak, mm. it is so vyapak, covers everyone, that they, they, they see it almost like a kind of uh, natural f phenomenon, if not a natural calamity. And, and I think I, that is admirable. What they, probably will begin to analyze is the motivations of this uh, in a little while. But if it gets handled in a way in which um, the punch doesn't hurt, yeah. they will then pass it and await the next calamity. 
the peculiar uh, and paradoxical uh, and fascinating Indian mindset as you, as, as you have uh, spoken about it. As always, the people of India are the victors. We leave it there, Kopal Gandhi. Pleasure to have you on the program. Thank Mr. You, Gandhi's yeah. new book, Death Penalty, Why India Should Say No to Capital Punishment. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks.